I'm Richard Walker, Executive Director of the Benjamin Rush Institute. We hope you enjoy today's edition of the Benjamin Rush Institute's virtual events series. This series would not be possible without the support of foundations that endorse the mission of the Benjamin Rush Institute, our student chapter members, and individuals like you. Through your support, we are able to continue informing and educating today's medical students about the benefits of patient-centered, doctor-focused methods for the practice of medicine, just like those discussed in this series. I encourage you to visit our website to learn more about the Benjamin Rush Institute and the medical students we serve. While you're there, please consider a donation to support our educational programs and events just like this one. You can donate by card, check, or by mail. Thanks for your support, and thanks for watching the Benjamin Rush Institute's virtual events series. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for joining me today, uh, part of our Benjamin Rush Institute live virtual event series. Um, it is now our first event in November. We have been having these um, events since April in, in response to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. We pretty seamlessly moved to a fully virtual um, event series uh, when medical schools closed down at the end of March. Um, we're pretty excited about the response that we've had to these events. Uh, and we've had some events going on on campuses now as campuses have opened up in a hybrid model. Most of them are still almost fully virtual with clinicals being back in the hospital. Uh, the, the events that we have had have been virtual. So we're going to continue this series uh, and we're scheduled into the new year now, uh, so which is pretty exciting. Um, we still don't know who our president is, but what is really uh, heartening for Benjamin Rush Institute is the people that have supported uh, free market health care, the biggest and the strongest in both the House and the Senate were mostly reelected. And that is huge for free market health care uh, and what has already been passed during the Trump administration. Um, so we are excited to see what is going to happen in the next two and four years, uh, despite, you know, no matter what happens in the uh, presidential administration. Uh, we've had some big things happen and we're hoping that we can continue that. Uh, one of the biggest supporters of free market health care and big changes to what we see in health care is joining us today. And I'm very excited about that. Um, direct primary care is a big buzzword, a uh, big buzz phrase. And one of the biggest advocates of direct primary care is Dr. Chad Savage. Uh, Dr. Savage founded Your Choice Direct Care in 2015, which is one of the first DPC, direct primary care practices in the state of Michigan. Um, I'm personally happy I'm not in Michigan today, um, seeing everything that's going on. He's been an active advocate of the DPC model of care, free markets and medicine, and patient empowerment at both the state and the national level. Dr. Savage adopted the DPC model of care to focus on his patients' needs without worrying about meeting unproven requirements set by insurance companies and Medicare. Uh, Dr. Savage graduated from the University of Michigan prior to receiving his MD from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. He completed his residency training at Washington University School of Medicine and Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis. Dr. Savage has been practicing medicine since 2003 and was involved in physician leadership through the St. John Providence Hospital System prior to starting his DPC practice. You can find him everywhere. He's written op-eds. He's been in The Hill, Investors Business Daily, Real Clear Health, American Thinker. Um, he's on radio shows, on the news. Uh, you can find him on Twitter extensively. Um, you know, you can follow him on LinkedIn. You can find him everywhere because he is an enormous advocate. He's a mem member of the Michigan State Medical Society Legislative Committee, a healthcare policy advisor for the Heartland Institute, our good friends, healthcare policy fellow at Docs for Patient Care, and he's on the board of directors for DPC Action. These are the advocates that we need to keep this, this movement moving. Um, I am thrilled that he's here today. I think this is just such a, a fantastic time to have Dr. Savage here and to hear what he thinks about free market healthcare. 
um, and where we are today and where we're moving. So I'm going to get off the screen and I am going to turn it over to Dr. Chad Savage. Oh, before I go, please ask questions. Uh, we are gonna hear Dr. Savage speak. Uh, no matter what platform that you're viewing this from, there is a chat feature. Uh, please ask your questions and we're gonna compile those and then I'm gonna come back and we're gonna ask chat, uh, Dr. Savage your questions. So, you know, free markets are, are an interesting thing. It gets vilified a lot. Many people say that free markets can't be done in healthcare because it's a unique industry different from others. But I hope to show in the next uh, about 20 to 30 minutes that not only are, are, are they very possible in healthcare, they're currently being done and they're an absolute necessity to correct what's going on uh, with American healthcare. So to begin with, we have to define, well, what is a free market? According to dictionary.com, a free market is an economic system in which prices and wages are determined by unrestricted competition between businesses without government regulation or fear of monopolies. And a major part of free markets are free exchange. If you notice the word free keeps coming up and that's, that's a good thing. Um, it, it's a voluntary, a free, a voluntary exchange. It's a transaction where parties trade goods or services freely with no coercion or restrictive force involved. In other words, both parties are willing and able to exchange items as they wish. That means the transactions when they occur within a free market are voluntary transactions. They only occur when both parties benefit. And in, in different types of systems like communism and socialism, coercion or force can be used to make one party have a bad transaction, but in an attempt to uh, uh, essentially force that transaction to occur. So is the American healthcare system free market? This is used a lot by, by advocates of uh, socialized single party payer systems that they claim that the American system is failing, it's a free market, so therefore free markets um, fail in healthcare. Well, I would counter that that is absolutely not true. We are just less socialized than other systems. And the reason why is, is you need fluidity of pricings for a, free, for a free market to work. Well, do we have that in the United States? And the answer is actually no. Many people do not know this, but prices in the United States are largely set by an, a panel at the AMA called the Relative Value Scale Update Committee. Um, and, and this is a 31 member panel. It's composed largely of specialists and special interest uh, physicians who set the value of medical services using a, a essentially unit of value called the relative value unit. Now, this is an interesting uh, uh, a, um, marker of value that is, is unique to medicine. And essentially we have created our own monetary unit. The rest of the economy transacts in dollars. In the American healthcare system, we transact in relative value units. Well, that 31 member panel places a relative value unit uh, price essentially on every medical service within the United States. They then take their recommendations and they submit them to the government, Medicare, who 95% of the time accepts at whole cloth their recommendations. And these now become set as the Medicare reimbursement rate for those services. Now, every single private payer, essentially, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Humana, U United Health, whichever, they all base their, their reimbursements on a modifier of the Medicare rate. So for example, Blue Cross Blue Shield may say, well, we're gonna pay for a medical office visit at 150% the rate of Medicare. So if Medicare charges $100, Blue Cross Blue, or reimburses $100, Blue Cross Blue Shield will reimburse 150. But what that means, if you think about that by extension, those all started with the 31 member panel at the AMA, the Relative Value Committee. So the AMA sets the prices for Medicare, Medicare sets the prices for all private payers. So essentially all non-free market transactions, and there are not a lot of us out there, but are the regular insurance-based system is all based on the 31 member panel at the AMA, which sounds very much like a Politburo and we all know how well the Politburo worked out. So how is American healthcare designed structurally? So one quick fallacy I'd like to argue against is that healthcare could or is or ever could be free. So healthcare is paid by the patient. And this is done through a variety of mechanisms. So American citizens, they either pay uh, an insurer through a premium. And you can see that uh, if you can see my cursor, it follows through the patient pays the dollars to the premium or they pay it through, through the government. And this is done through many uh, mechanisms, through deferred wages, through di direct payments of premiums, through taxes and other mechanisms. But, but it's important to note that those dollars do originate from the, that person uh, in, in the beginning. 
Now, if you pay the government, uh, the government, interestingly enough, largely does not administer their own insurance, their, the Medicare plan. They outsource that management to private insurers like United Health um, and, and others who, who then, uh, then pay the physician. Now, at each step of this payment mechanism, those entities, the government and the private insurer, take part of that payment. But even worse, they actually influence the care itself. They put stipulations on the payment, which means they're not only controlling the flow of dollars and, and taking a chunk of it at each step, but they're also influencing the doctor-patient relationship. And once those dollars end up going to the physician, if you notice where the physician's attention is, it's not focused on the patient as it should be. It's focused on completion of the paperwork that justifies the payment to the insurance company, who then justifies the payment to the government, who pays with the money that derived from the patient in the first place. So direct care does this. It gets rid of all this coercion, all this waste, all this mess. And if you watch the physician's head, it restores the attention of the physician back to the patient by allowing that physician to work for the patient. The attention of the system always goes back to where the money is coming from. So if it's coming from the insurance company or the government, the attention is always fixated on those entities. But when the money flows through the patient and those patients are allowed to retain their own, remember the money started with them, retain their own purchasing power, the attention uh, stays focused exactly where it should be, which is on the patient. Now, a lot of people will complain and say, well, yes, but what about the person who's truly uh, uh, economically disadvantaged and does not have the ability to engage in those transactions on their own. Well, under a direct uh, care model, there's absolutely nothing that says that that person cannot receive help from their family, from their friends, from charities, or yes, even from the government. So, you know, medical care is, is a huge problem in the United States, not the quality of it. We've got pretty good quality of care in the United States. But the pricing is incredibly bad because of that system and the disassociation with reality that the Relative Value Committee creates. It's not controlled by standard supply and demand and free market uh, mechanisms. Uh, instead, it's a fixed pricing system. And we in the United States spend 3.8 trillion with a T dollars in healthcare every single year. So that number is so large that it's actually hard to comprehend and wrap your head around. So I, I decided, I went and I looked one time and I said, you know, that's more akin to gross domestic products or entire, entire economic output of countries. So if you were to take the American healthcare system and break it down into the equivalence of economic output of other countries, their entire economy, their healthcare system, their manufacturing, their food distribution, their service, every industry that they have, the American healthcare system costs the same as the entire economic output of these countries. This goes on for a while. This is one country every 0.5 seconds. Now it's true, a lot of these are not large or wealthy countries. But when you add them up in total, these account for 20% of the global population. So America on healthcare alone spends the equivalent of the entire economic output of 20% of the global population. That was 120 nations. We have a problem. So one of those solutions is to try to get more purchasing power again back into the hands of the patient and let them control those transactions. Now, as I understand it, last week you had uh, Dr. Keith Smith of the Oklahoma Surgical Center. So he described how that is done on a more specialized service like surgical interventions. And if they can be done at surgical interventions, which can be more costly, they certainly, primary uh, direct payments can absolutely be done uh, for more common things such as, as primary care, which are much less costly um, uh, uh, services. So I'm a direct primary care uh, provider, DPC. And just as an example for my clinic, we, we charge between 49 to $79 per month for 
all of our office visits. So these people can see us as much as they need. We never charge them co-pays. We schedule in 30 minute and one hour increments. And we usually try to get them in same day for if they have a sick visit. It includes all in-office diagnostics, EKG, spirometries, pulse oximetries, you know, um, uh, uh, and, and procedures including joint injections, cryotherapy, basic biopsies. And what I like and was a big one is telemedicine. This is only recently with the COVID crisis become mainstreamed, but we were perfectly set up for this because we've been doing telemedicine uh, without any co-pays uh, seamlessly in, with our patients since 2015 when we started our practice. And then what we do is we went out into the community to say, okay, so we can discount our services and get a good price, but can we get good prices for our patients on other services too? And we're working with local uh, uh, specialists, we have been able to get things like a stress echocardiogram, which is a very high quality stress test. The hospital, our local hospital charges $2,000 for that, we get it for a little over $200, 90% less than the hospital. And for people who have insurances, classically, they have an 80-20 copay, meaning they pay 20% of that charge, which means they are better off substantially by ignoring their insurance altogether for this transaction. Uh, we get imaging services, and these are important numbers to remember because I'm going to refer back to them later, but we can get MRIs, which charge at $4,200 to our local hospital, and we can get them for around $300. X-rays of the lower back charged from the University of Michigan through their transparency website at just under $600. We're able to get them for about $43. And then um, we get labs. And these are some common uh, prices for, for laboratory services for, through our local university hospital. A cholesterol panel charges at $135. We get it, as you'll see on the right side of the screen, for $5. An A1C, $120, we get it for $4. $137 for a ferritin level, we get it for a little over $5. And PSA levels, $150, we get them from seven. Understand the um, recommendations based on PSA testing, partly when they try to recommend against it, usually one of the justifications is that it's so costly to do. Well, they should not be basing it on cost because they have no idea how much these things really cost. They should either base their recommendations on as to whether or not they're a good service to do or not, because once they start mucking around with the cost, they're, they're getting into territory they have no idea about. These are not expensive services. Uh, we also, uh, just FYI, I didn't have this slide, but we also do medicines, medications we dispense from our office. And then one example I like to use is the drug Norvasc, which is a good treatment for, for uh, hypertension. Uh, our office is currently able to dispense a 100-day supply of Norvasc, one of the, an antihypertensive agent one for uh, reducing blood pressure, one of the leading causes of premature preventable death in the United States. We can treat that for 100 days with Norvasc for 70 cents. That works out to per month. We can treat hypertension, uh, one of the leading causes of death, for less than the cost of a, of a single gumball for an entire month. So to kind of show how this works together, I wanted to, to take aggregate costs. I wanted to take a hypothetical year and forget the three patient aspect on the top of the screen. This is going to be one patient. I pulled this from another presentation, but I'm going to call him Bob. 58-year-old guy, diabetic. Uh, during the course of his entire year, he has a scare with some pneumonia. Uh, he gets some chest pain, totally plausible for, for a diabetic as they tend to die from heart disease. Um, so we wanted to look at the entire cost of care through an insurance model, which is kind of towards the middle. And on the right, you'll see under a direct care approach. So once you start adding up his costs, his, if you look at our membership rate, that includes not only his physical, but all of his in-office medical care and those other services we described. Um, and then you start adding on things such as labs. The local hospital charges $327 for initial visit physical. Their annual labs, if, if you took a, a standard lab battery, it's charged at $622. So right off the bat, if you look at our, our annual membership fee and combined with what we are able to get annual labs from, you will see that that person is actually saving money on the very first visit in their actual costs of care. This is not including insurance. If you start adding up quarterly office visits, quarterly labs, we threw in the medications, uh, $176 estimated retail for lisinopril. Seems high. This is a two-year-old slide that thinks it's come down. We're able to get the entire year for under $4. Metformin, Crestor, flu shot. And we take in, they have, he has a, a few other visits during the year for, for non-preventative services. 
uh, or, or uh, chronic disease management. He gets a bout of pneumonia. We get a chest x-ray for, for him. It's uh, $300 through the hospital. It's about $40 through us. We try, give him a, get him a Z-pack. We follow him up, make sure it's cleared. Uh, the visit is included because all, mem- all visits are included under the membership model. He gets a scare with some chest pain and racing heart. We do an EKG on him. We get a halter monitor. We do our stress tests. The, uh, the uh, halter monitor is 350 through the insurance. We include it in our membership. The stress test, I mentioned those price points. Uh, this one is an older price point. The actual price has gone up in our area. Um, his total year charges through the insurance model are $6,600. The entire charges through the direct primary care, the direct approach is, is $982. And that's not for the same care. I would argue that is for vastly better care. We get them in same day longer visits, more personalized attention, telemedicine. He saves by simply changing how he pays for the system, $5,600 on the actual cost of care in the course of what would largely for a diabetic patient not be a crazy unusual year. Now, a lot of you may be saying, okay, yeah, sure, but a lot of that would have been picked up by his insurance product. And that may be true. But when you think about what the insurance product costs, you also have to think about the, er, the care under insurance. You also have to think of the cost of the insurance. So this slide is about two years old. I went to the uh, Michigan uh, ACA exchange and I did some price point uh, assessments for him. And what you'll see here is the gray part of the bar is the premium. That's what you pay every year, whether or not you see a doctor or not. That's for the honor of having the insurance card in your pocket. The red part of the bar is what you pay above and beyond the premium for the actual care through either direct payment or through co-payments. So under the leftmost graph, the bar graph, that is a gold plan under an insured model. And what you see is if he purchases a gold plan insurance plan, he spends an astronomical $17,752 in annual premium alone just for having the insurance product before he's ever received an ounce of medical care. And understand, this was two years ago. This is worse now. Um, now, the insurance picks up part of the cost of that actual care. Remember that, uh, that, that price point of the $6,600. Now, some of that is picked up under the premium. Things like the physical exam and the once a year labs are, are buried in that premium. So that does not tack on to the red part of the bar. Uh, however, the rest is paid either 100% out of pocket through because he is under his deductible or at, at an 80-20, which means 80% of that charge is picked up by the insurance and 20% of the charge is passed on to the patient, which means shockingly, after that massive, massive premium, he is still liable for $1,135 out of pocket for his medical care. The next bar over shows the exact same scenario, but now he's using a less expensive insurance product and paying more out of pocket at the time of service. Now, interestingly enough, many people denigrate the less costly insurance plans, um, but he is actually still saving money here because that, the cost of that care is offset by a larger reduction in that premium cost. So he's actually still better off, even in the traditional insurance plan, getting a bronze plan and insured. When he starts combining saying, listen, I'm going to forget my insurance to, to pay for medical care. And he does a direct care approach in combination with a bronze plan. He saves nearly $5,000 from doing this through the insured process. And then when you start getting down to the list, this is where he starts getting clever. He says, okay, I I know if I pay for my care alone, I'm going to save a lot of money. What if I get a less expensive coverage product? So I'm going to go down here and look at the STLD. That's a short-term limited duration policy. These are very high uh, deductible plans, usually around $10,000. They only cover catastrophe, but they're also very inexpensive. He saves $15,000 in premium from the gold plan. And when he accesses care using a direct approach, he only pays $982, which means that when you combine for the exact same care, again, only changing how you pay for the system, getting less expensive coverage, paying it directly versus running everything through an insurance company, he saves $15,863 in a regular year by not uh, rationing care, simply getting more effective care in a direct approach. One thing that's interesting here too is with his co-payments and his deductibles under that gold plan, many people buy these expensive premiums because they think, well, when I access care, I want to save money when I access it. He paid more in co-payments and deductibles through the insurance model than he would have had he ignored it altogether. So what is this? So basically my point here is that there is a massive, massive distortion in pricing here. 
And because of this distortion of pricing, we have lost our profession. So it is argued that because prices are high, we can't pay for medical care ourselves. We must give our money to an insurance company or to the government to manage our funds for us. And we're told that somehow that will save money. We're also told that because prices are high, that you can't refer to any doctor that you deem is appropriate or the best doctor in your area. You must be forced to stick to restrictive networks and only refer to the doctors the insurance company uh, says that you're, you're able to. And we're told that that will save money. And because prices are high, we must subjugate ourselves to decision trees, algorithms, you know, clinical judgment be damned. You now must fo follow a cookbook met practice of medicine and we're told that that is going to save money. Uh, because prices are high, we also can't prescribe the treatments that we want. We, we may have to avoid giving the drug that we think is ideal and instead uh, take only the medication off of the formulary that the insurance company says that we can use and we are told that that will save money. And then because prices are high, we are asked to engage in risk arrangements, shared risk arrangements like ACOs, where doctors are financially incentivized to avoid sick people, because if you have sick people, they cost more money and you may bear some of the costs of their risk. And we are told that that will save money. And because prices are high now, we are, we are shifted into becoming data entry clerks, following up uh, care, uh, excuse me, value metrics, forced to input these data and, and instead of pay, focusing on patient care, and we are told that that will save money. Because prices are high too, then we can't do the treatment plans that we want. We can't order the testing we need, to, we need to, for that patient. Instead, we must beg for permission from an insurance company or from the government through staying on hold for 30 minutes, an hour, hour and a half to get authorizations. And we're told that spending all that time doing this will save money. Then the third parties, because prices are high, add in departments of what I like to call price saving schemes, various departments that manage all these various uh, interventions, and they, they increase their staffing to do so, and we are told that that will save money. And, and because prices are high and because insurance companies have added their departments of price saving schemes with whom we must co communicate, doctor's offices must add staff to deal with the departments of price saving schemes at the insurance companies. Uh, and because we're increasing our staff, we're told that that will save money, but all of that makes prices high. So it's a circular argument. The false argument that prices are high has actually led to a true increase in cost in the United States. So why is this, uh, can I give an example of that kind of distortion? Well, I can, here's, a, here's an example of a treatment algorithm. So back in, the day back when I trained in the 90s, uh, treatment algorithms were just coming into vogue. And, um, and you know, they were reasonable. They had disclaimers all over them. They said, these are simply tools to assist with complex decision-making. These are not to supplant clinical judgment. Numerous uh, 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 disclaimers on them about that. But nowadays, your clinical judgment is thrown aside. And, and in fact, these are now mandated, mandated treatment algorithms. So uh, what, what, and this is based on, for example, for back pain, why can't you just treat the way you deem uh, it necessary? Well, it's because maybe you would order an MRI and MRIs, the, the argument goes, are expensive. But is that true? Because of the MRIs being expensive, you must do x-rays first. But as I mentioned that slide that I wanted you to remember from earlier, we can obtain an MRI for less than half the cost that the hospital charges for their x-rays which is built on the fallacy that MRIs are expensive. So I ask you, if you had money and you were going to try to most efficiently use it in the healthcare system, knowing what you know now from this presentation, would you wanna put it in the insurance company bucket? And my answer is of course not, because you'll only end up with cents on the dollar. Well, how about the governmental bucket? Well, no. The government takes part of that dollar, gives it to the insurance company who takes part of that dollar, and you end up with even fewer uh, pennies to pay for your medical care. If you're going to spend a dollar within the healthcare system, keep it within that patient themselves who will rationally use it, who will, who will use it most efficiently, will get a dollar's worth of care, and for whom is the location that is most appropriate for ethical decision making in regarding life and death decisions when they are the ones who would suffer it. There's no 
more ethical location for that decision making than to retain it with the patient instead of the government or the insurance companies. Now to end, I'd like to, challenge, to, to try to take on something that's somewhat challenging. We all hear now, it's a popular catchphrase that healthcare is a right, but is that actually true? Well, I went to the Oxford Dictionary to determine uh, what it, it is to be defined as a right. And one of their definitions of a right is a moral or legal entitlement to have or to do something. Okay, so if healthcare is a right, we have to define what they mean uh, by a right. And if they, and they define it, again, moral or legal entitlement. So if they go by the definition that healthcare is a moral right, it means that it is an ideal. It is something that should be striven for, but it is not legally binding. This is neither controversial uh, or, again, legally binding. This means it's an ideal that we should, as a society, try to make healthcare accessible and affordable to all of our populace. People left wing, people right wing, I think everyone can jump on and say, yes, healthcare is a moral right. The problem comes around when you start saying, no, it's a legal right. And the reason why is that means that if you have a legal right to healthcare, you have a legal right to someone else's labors, regardless of whether or not you can pay for that service or, or, or give them any choice in that transaction at all. So if you have a legal right to someone else's labors, that person loses the right to control their own labor. You essentially can create an indentured servant. So you conflict with their rights. But one other aspect of this, when it comes to healthcare right, you also have to define what is healthcare. Now that may sound like an obvious uh, answer, but in fact, it's not as obvious as many would assume. There's a lot of variety in, in opinions of what healthcare is. And one example is that a lot of my patients feel that massage is a part of their healthcare. They get massages, it decreases their stress, musculoskeletal wise, they feel better. They, they may in fact be right, that that is actually something that's reasonable to consider as part of their healthcare. But if they have a right to massage, and the presumption here is that the, the, they're assuming that the government will pay for that massage, and the government obtains their money from the populace, and if you don't pay your taxes, um, they can potentially confiscate your personal property, you can make the argument that in an attempt to pay for my neighbor's massage, the government could confiscate my car to which I don't have a right. So long story short, free markets and healthcare would actually fix the pricing problem, free patients and free doctors within the healthcare system, dramatically improve our quality and make American health care, uh, excuse the phrase, but great again. I appreciate your uh, attention. I appreciate it. I think for me, you know, I always learn a lot from hearing a physician, a practicing physician's um, take on what free market healthcare is and how it's affected your practice um, and where we are and where we're moving forward. So I really appreciate um, your take on that. Um, we do have some questions. Um, I think we're going to start with kind of my favorite on this one. Um, price transparency. We just had a pretty big, you know, we, we talked about that uh, last week with, um, with Dr. Smith, um, kind of the grandfather. Um, he, he's going to love the fact that I just called him that. <laughs> um, but with hospitals, with insurance companies, with everyone being required now to talk about what DPC doctors have already been doing, um, what everybody should have been doing. How do you think that's going to affect healthcare moving forward? Um, and how do you think that's going to affect DPC practices? Well, it won't have any effect on us. We've always been transparent. Yeah. I apologize for the phone ringing in the background. Um, you know, transparency is one half of the puzzle. Um, because if you have transparency alone and you have fabricated pricing, it builds into that fallacy I was mentioning that actually makes people buy into the argument that you can't afford it. I see that a lot. I have a patient who actually is a, a part of my DPC practice that totally understands what we're doing, but bought into this fallacy. She, God forbid, had to have recent cancer treatment. And she put a post up on Facebook saying, my God, I got this $120,000 charge for my cancer therapy. Thank God I have insurance. I'm not, I'm not uh, being sarcastic with that. 
Um, when my argument was that that didn't cost anywhere near one hundred twenty thousand dollars, it's likely it probably cost you know twelve thousand dollars. That was all you know. Mo if you go into this and you start working in prices, you find that most of it's totally fictitious and fabricated. But it built on it actually created a sense of helplessness. Boy, without them, I couldn't have never done this. And twelve thousand dollars is still a lot. Maybe maybe she did need help with that. But transparency without agency is actually counterproductive. Agency means the uh, ability to act upon them. So transparency, ability to know what prices are, agency, the ability to act upon them. And for that, that means, um, and, and we actually have the opposite side of that, high deductibles. So you have a really, really high deductible, you control those dollars, but you find out half the time what, your, what the cost was after you did the service. So you get the MRI, you have no idea what it's going to cost. A month later, you get a gotcha bill in the mail that says it was $4,000. And because it's under your $7,000 deductible, you have to pay the whole thing. So that's agency, but no, but you didn't have the transparency. The real benefit is when you have both. You know what prices are and you have the ability to act on them before you obtain that service. And we are so close to this. Um, and, you know, President Trump, I don't know if he'll, he'll be with us, but he, he has put in some uh, programs that really have a, a, an abil a chance that they could transform our healthcare system if they're left unmolested. He, he has the transparency bill that he recently passed, which should make prices apparent. And then if you combined it with things that like Mike Pence did when he was in Indiana, which when he had the Healthy Indiana Plan, where they gave agency to Medicaid recipients, they gave money, they said, listen, we're going to spend this money on you but we're gonna let you control some of these funds. So go ahead, shop around, find the services you deem appropriate. When they first did that, they didn't have the transparency. So even though they did decrease costs and the patients were very happy with that plan, they only partly accomplished its potential. If you now have the transparency with the agency, they're gonna want better prices and better care and they're gonna get both. So that's a good lead into, we talked about President Trump. If we are looking at, you know, I, I kind of led into the fact that we are going to keep some of our greatest advocates in both the House and the Senate, which is fantastic news. Um, but if we do, if we do end up looking at a Biden administration, what, where do you see uh, the biggest fights? Because I know you and DPC Action, thank goodness, have been leaders in where, where we moved with, the, with transparency, but also with HSA. Um, yeah. Uh, which is wonderful for everything that has been accomplished. What do you see being the biggest, uh, the biggest issues? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, you know, it was going to be a fight no matter what after this election, uh, because we, we have not reached perfection yet. In fact, we never will. I, I, I was uh, at a event recently with Sheriff Clark from Milwaukee, and I thought he, he said it very aptly. He said, I've entered the race that has no finish line. And so, when, and he was talking about the race for liberty, and, and obviously we're kind of fighting for healthcare liberty. So it's the same regard. But our, our hope was is that if, if President Trump had or, or potentially still could be reelected, we would be fighting downhill. Um, we will continue the fight, but we will be fighting uphill, which is un unfortunate. And some of the specific things on that is he could walk back, pres uh, potentially President Biden could walk back some of the uh, improvements uh, President Trump has made. President Trump got rid of or zeroed out the individual mandate, for example. The individual mandate is the penalty you receive if you do not buy a government sanctioned and expensive insurance product. Uh, and instead buy something different. And one of the product, one of the uh, results of that were, were for example, uh, short-term limited duration policies became more prominent. And those are that really inexpensive coverage that I mentioned in, the, in the, my, my discussion. Um, the uh, indemnity plans are other options and expansion of health sharing ministries that have been, there will still be some, but we're gonna see that walked back and fewer options for people. Um, so that will be bad. Then the real question is, isn't, isn't just things like that, which are, are beneficial to HRAs, HSAs, all these things. But the real question is, is are we going to go in totally opposite direction where you get single party payer, which is single choice healthcare? Really, you know, if you've subjugated yourself totally to governmental decision making, you've abdicated all of your own. So you better darn well hope that you agree with the decisions the government has because you, you don't have any uh, on your own. And Canada actually experienced this. And understand Canada's great safety valve is the United States. They get, they, people who don't like the care there can come to the United States. In fact, they do so. They flood there. I'm sure Keith can tell you that from last week, Keith Smith, the Surgical Center of Oklahoma gets quite a bit of medical tourism from Canada. 
Um, we, we get it here in, in Michigan. We get people coming across the border. Well, where does, where does America go? You know, where are we going to go? There's some centers down in the Caribbean that have opened and may, but, but I mean, that's ridiculous. You should be able to go down to the local hospital and, and get your care and get what you want of your care. So, so the, Canada had for a little while actually outlawed private payment. They said, if we don't authorize it, you can't get it. And it was illegal to have private payment for medical services. Now, thankfully, that was uh, openly defied. There were clinics in Toronto that were out on the street with signs up, you know, just blatantly defying those orders. And the government didn't shut them down because they knew it was it was political kryptonite because they, they were they were so uh, liked. And now what you see is even in the single party payer system, which is, of, of the world is usually see a private system built upon the dysfunctional, uh, uh, you know, governmentally run plans. Uh, France has that where they have uh, government hospitals, they have private hospitals, you know, many different countries have that. And, and the people only go to the government hospitals when they have no other choice. So we do not want that in the United States. I hope if, if, if it should be a President Biden that he does not go that way, um, I think he will. Um, and this is supported by, unfortunately, uh, I think this is part of a long plan that has been brewing for a long time. Uh, since Harry Reid, with the passage of ACA Obamacare, he flat out said they got a lot of pushback on that. He got pushback from the progressives in, in, the, in the Democratic Party who, who were mad at him about ACA. And what they were mad about wasn't that they were breaking up the current system. They were mad that it didn't go far enough. They weren't immediately going to single party payer. And he, he tried to placate them and say, relax, relax. We're going to get there. This is just stage one. We've got many steps to go. Well, sadly, I think we're at step two. And the public option is the Trojan horse for that. The tro public option is a government-run insurance plan that will be highly subsidized, meaning it'll be falsely reducing the costs to people. Again, just taking money from your taxes and de divert them, diverting them over there. But then the private insurances won't be able to compete with that because they aren't getting subsidies. Well, they are under ACA, but they wouldn't under this scenario. Uh, and thus you would be left as all the private insurers exit the market, you're left with only the public option, which is now by default, single party payer through attrition. Oh, <laughs> you're scaring me. Um, All right. I hope it doesn't happen, but that, that's a distinct possibility. No, I mean, that I, I think that is what it's for us and for students. Uh, one of the things that we have done a number of debates on before the pandemic was uh, what single payer health care actually is, um, because I think it's it's not understood um, as well as it should should be. Um, and it's one of our favorite things to debate, actually. Um, medical, medical schools and doctors do not debate like um, law students do. You know, it's not, mm -hmm. you, you talked about the ethics of, of insurance, the ethics of healthcare a little bit earlier. Um, that's one of our favorite things to talk about is, you know, the ethics behind things. And I think that is what a lot of our debates end up going to. Um, well, if I can, yeah. I mean, the ethical thing is to try to make it affordable, right? Yeah, and exactly. free markets do that better than anything else. Free markets have lifted more people from poverty than any other economic system in the history of the world. That is ethical. That, that is ethical. You know, saying on a hypothetical that we will help help the poor, but in fact, you just you just make everyone poor is that that's real world. That's what really happens. Um, yeah, the, the um, you know, talking about the single payer systems too, the, I wonder why they are so popular, the concept of them. And what I've come to is when I talk to people about single party payer system, they're always thrilled by it. And the reason why is because they're envisioning whatever they envision the utopian, uh, utopian version of healthcare, they, they project their own vision onto single party payer, but only free, you know? So, so it's perfect healthcare, but free. Um, but the reality is quite different. I've got an op-ed coming out about Ezekiel Emanuel's complete live system. And not to get too in the weeds here, but hopefully this is an intelligent uh, audience. He, in 2009, he, and he was an, one of the architects of ACA, Obamacare, and he is one of the healthcare policy advisors for, for Biden. Um, is he designed it a, 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 a so I wish I should have pulled that up, a, a specific distribution of medical resources on a, on a curve based on age. And what it did is if you got your graph here, and this is age here, zero is here. It goes up, it flattens out, and then it drifts on down. Where it drifts down is 55. Hmm. 55 years of age, it starts drifting down almost to zero. 
And the concept of that is, is, is a very dystopic humans are ex disposable widgets kind of philosophy. His argument is, well, why should society spend money on these people if they've essentially burned up their economic utility? So we're all just worker drones now. But what's really horrendous about that is, again, it goes up from zero. It is near zero at age zero. Babies get almost no health care, according to Ezekiel Emanuel. And, and he actually has this in his academic paper. This is out there, the complete live system. Anybody can look it up. Anybody can read it. Uh, and his argument is, well, society hasn't spent money on them yet in the sense of education and such. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, okay, if you've got a widget and it's used up, it's, you, you throw it away, right? That's the 55 cutoff. The opposite argument is true too. If you have a widget that comes off the assembly line and it's dysfunctional, you throw it away. Right. You know, so this is fine when you're making widgets on an assembly line. This is a ghastly atrocity when it's proposed for human lives. That's interesting. When Dr. Smith last week talked about, um, you're constantly asked the question when you're talking about um, that insurance must be given to the poor and healthcare must be given to the poor. And he talked about generalizations, that that's constantly something that you do, that it's, it's always, you're, you're asked to generalize all of humanity instead of bringing it to the one person, to the one instance of things. Um, and you, you can't do that. You have to say, give me an example. Give me that one example. Let's talk about that one example. So whenever somebody says, everyone, all the poor, everyone, we, we have to treat and we have to give insurance to all of the poor. And that's, that's what we're saying. He's like, yeah, you can't do that. You can't say um, that we, we, when you're talking about this, you have to talk about the one. You'd have to talk about the singular. And that's how we have to talk about this. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's interesting that you're, you, that you're using um, that particular instance, I think, because, we're, you know, let's talk about that zero year old, that newborn. Um, and whose is it? Is it yours? Is it mine? Yeah. Um, and, and these things happen in single party pairs. Absolutely. Uh, again, you can argue that this was truly a case of, of medical futility, but I, <laughs> and I can't remember her name, but there was a, a, a young girl, if I recall correctly, in England who they were denying care through the NHS England single party payer system. The, the parents actually said, okay, fine. We're going, we want to pay for this care in England ourselves to get the, and they said, no, they, basically you have to let your child die. And they, they, and they said, well, we're using our own funds. We have, we have literally funds coming in from around the world to try it. No, you can't do it. Okay. Well, we'll take her out of the country to get this care. And they refused it. They said they could not use their own care. They could, not, they could not pay their own money to access care. They couldn't even leave the country to another, another country to try to save their child, even if it probably was truly uh, uh, futile. But who can, let them try. It's their money. Right. You know, it's their, it's their lives. It's their child. It's, 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 it's ghastly that they, they said, no, because we have made a decision and that decision is final, even though it has no impact on the NHS, the National Health Service is what they were going to do. They were refusing to allow the, the, this family even to try to save their child. And talking about NHS, when people think about, well, they'll get whatever kind of medical care they want. Mm -hmm. Well, as long as your body mass index isn't over 30, not too long ago, NHS um, uh, decided that they were going to deny elective surgeries to people with a body mass index over 30. Well, this, this breaks the compact, right? I give you my tax money, you return by giving me the medical care. Um, well, they were denying it. They were taking, still taking tax money from these people, but they were not allowing them to do medical services because of body mass index of 30. Well, imagine how much of the United States population that is. If we had that same policy here, that's sadly, that's a huge chunk of the American populace would be denying, they would be breaking that compact if we did something analogous here. Absolutely. I want to get to a few more questions here. Um, you talked about um, the, when you were talking about DPC specifically and um, the pharmaceuticals that DPC doctors are dispensing, mm -hmm. um, I think there, uh, somebody asked a point of clarification. Are these first line pharmaceuticals? They're not coming from China, Mexico, they're US pharmaceuticals. I think it was a point of <laughs> clarification for pricing. Well, they're, they're coming from everywhere. For, first of all, if you're thinking manufactured um, if you go down to CVS, most of your drugs are coming from, from India, uh, Israel, and other countries. There is not a robust generic manufacturing in, in the United States. There's some, obviously, and it may improve. Um, 
So we get them from the exact same distributors as does CVS, Rite Aid, Walgreens, and whatever. We we get the we we use the same distributors as they do. We're not getting some you know some guy down the street who's using you know making some knockoff drugs or something like that. No, they're legitimate drugs. Um, we, the pricing is just about you know people. When I first present these concepts and these price points, people think it's a scam. That's so funny to me. That, that one of the first reactions is people go, oh, that pricing's too good, must be a scam. No, no, the pricing is so bad, the current system is the scam. The, the markups are not in the tens or even hundreds of percents. They're in the thousands of percent markups on, on these items. And I know that because I get the same services from LabCorp, uh, from Quest for labs. Um, I, I get them from uh, major, the third largest distributor in the United States for, for medications. Um, we send them down to the same in- imaging centers. The difference is, is one pay, well, you could go to see the same in- imaging center, pay for with your insurance, and you're going to get a totally different price than they understand if you're going to pay cash. Why? Because it's cheaper for them. They have, they have zero bad debt. They collect the money at the time of service. So there's zero bad debt. So collection rates are about 60%. If you, you charge something out about 60% of the time, you're going to get your payment. Or, or it's at a reduced r- amount. They get 100% of the payment at the time of service. They don't have to pay people to chase that bad debt. It's cheaper for them. It's cheaper for them to just work for the patient. Absolutely. Can people on Medicare use a BPC? Oh, absolutely. It gets a little hard to save as much money as we can save when people can control their insurance product. Here's one of the real big things about the presidential election that, that is concerning to me. There is something called a medical savings account, an MSA, which is analogous to an HSA for people who understand what those are, which is, could, it, it, they currently exist. They're, they're actually legal, but they don't, they're not used very much. Um, the president was trying to get those kind of uh, uh, services uh, to be able to use for direct payment through direct primary care and, and things. Like that. So this is why this is so big. The government funds an account under MSAs that the patient controls. It's analogous to that Healthy Indiana plan that I mentioned Mike Pence administered when he was governor of Indiana. Um, They attach it essentially to a Medicare catastrophic. And if people use those funds correctly, the money rolls over year to year and their out of pocket goes to zero with 100% coverage from Medicare because they they can roll those savings over. So greatly, this this is an interesting example too. When you talk about single party payer, single party payer is not necessarily universal healthcare. They are different concepts. Um, you can have uh, some sort of a plan that covered all Americans, kind of analogous to Singapore. Singapore covers all Singaporeans, or however you say it, but um, they have to they uh, uh, they control the funds when it comes to standard expenses, not the most expensive. They probably don't control their own you know neurosurgical costs or something, but they find their own doctors, they pay their own doctors. It's very much fitting in that mold that I mentioned in my talk that they control the dollars. That's different than single party payer where it, it, I would propose if you're ever going to do something like that. And if there's a Biden administration, I hope that and they want to go towards some universal program that they go to 330 million party payer, not single party payer. I like that. Did you just coin that? Sure. <laughs> go ahead. I don't copyright it. So. You should use it. Yeah. Um, okay. So I have a, I have a couple of questions that I've been, I've been asking most of our guests here. Um, and especially those that are in practice for themselves. I think it's very important. Uh, one of the, in talking to our students, um, one of the things that they're find that they have found, I mean, for years now, and you, you might've even seen this when you were in school, the lack of business um, training. Um, yeah. What would you suggest to students that, um, maybe they're interested in someday going into practice on their own, or maybe they just realize the fact that they, they're not going to get out of school with any business training. What would be your suggestion to that? Well, for, first of all, don't be terrified. Um, it's, it's easy to be scared of it. It's too complex. It's, you know, you know, biologic systems, you're some of the smartest people in the world to go to med school and, and work on biologic systems as complex and ridiculous as our financial systems are, they are a, they are simplistic in comparison to biological systems. So don't be scared of that. You can buy a four dummies book and figure out how to do half of this stuff. Um, So, uh, you know, it's, 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 you know, you can balance your own budget. You can, you can open a business. You need an accountant uh, to help you set it up some basic legal documents. The nice thing about direct primary care specifically is you have people like Josh Umber, um, uh, who I usually like to pick on, but actually he's a friend. Uh, and, and through Atlas MD, which is the electronic medical system, the EMR for Atlas, 
they help people kind of give them a roadmap as to how to set up their own DPC. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel here. We, when I was one of the early docs, so we kind of did, we had to reinvent the wheel and it was kind of scary. There's a ton of resources out there, a ton of people willing to kind of hold your hand and walk you through the process now. Uh, we'll, we'll let Josh know that, um, that you gave him a little plug there. Oh no, don't tell him that. Tell him, that. <laughs> tell him I insulted him broadly. <laughs> Dr. Umber is a good friend of ours, yeah. so we're very thankful yeah. for, for everything that he has. Tell, tell him you had to mute me because of all the four-letter yeah. words. I, I'll let him Josh know. Josh is a four-letter word. There yeah. you go. Josh is a four-letter <laughs> word. Um, yeah, so, uh, no, I, I, you know, we've heard that a lot is talking to the people um, that have been around and were the, you know, help start this, help start what's DPC now, even though it's what medicine has, you know, has always been um but this it wasn't around it wasn't the yeah. you were going to all the different specialists and saying what can we do here how can we work together and having yeah. a fee-for-service practice um things like atlas md and um you know those those kind of services are now there to help do that and put it automated and um so yeah that it's wonderful that we've moved into that direction um I know a lot of our students are just fearful of what that looks like. Um, that's one of the questions. Another question is. Well, one thing too, I mean, I hate to say, but, you know, and this is true. Uh, free market is, is, can be sometimes a vicious bedfellow. Um, the reason free markets work is that it's not real conducive to failure. Um, you've got to provide a good service. You've got to take good care of your patients. If you do, you will be glowingly successful. But if you do a lousy job, it's not so, actually the, the things that support lousy care are, are the systems where you can't get fired. Um, and that's why the single party payer, the employed networks and stuff don't tend to match up as well when they look at production and, and patient satisfaction to those docs who are out in the community working for their patients. Hmm. Um, I like that. Uh, the other question is, um, so we talked, you talked about telemedicine and how DPC doctors were, have been doing that. Um, as we move, hopefully soon, uh, out of the, the pandemic, however that looks like and whenever that looks like, various mm -hmm. opinions when that's going to happen, um, regulations have been, um, a lot of regulations have been put on hold because of the pandemic. Uh, if you had to name a few, if you had to name a few, um, and I, obviously that's, up for grabs as well with if we were looking at different administrations. Um, what would you say would be the biggest that you don't want to see? Okay, we don't want any to come back. But if you would say we can't have come back because it's just going to hurt us as a whole. Oh, gosh, I don't know. I mean, um, uh, I like you know, e everything's kind of lousy in the insurance model, in my opinion. I don't ever want it. I guess it wouldn't be anything within the insurance model. What is the worst? It would be that we in the private sector are forced into the insurance model, the insurance, the governmental insurance model. That's a real fear of mine because there were years, years ago, they were talking about Medicaid. Medicaid expansion occurred under ACA quite, quite substantially. A lot of people lost private insurance and were forced onto Medicaid and they, they were trumpeting it as this great thing because all, all these people were covered. Well, a lot, a lot of them weren't newly covered. They were just switching from private insurance to Medicaid. And some of them weren't even voluntary. They didn't, they made a, a low enough income that they were forced onto Medicaid. It, they were, I had some patients who were really upset about that. Well, what do you do then? Cause I said, well, if you, if we're going to try to make, you know, Medicaid the standard and well, what, what do you do if doctors refuse to take it? And one of the answers was we'll make them. You say, well, how do you make doctors take Medicaid? We'll hook it to licensure so that if you want to have a, a light, you can't practice with it. I mean, I'll tell you, there's been a weaponization of licensing. It's despicable. The, the licensing was supposed to be some sort of a guarantee of quality, um, some kind of, you know, hedge against, you know, quackery and things of this sort has been totally bastardized. It's, it's just, it's now it's, um, it's being weaponized. It's occurring a lot in my state. I'm in Michigan where they're hammering people who don't comply with governmental edicts, regardless of what they do for a living, threatening their licensing. We told you to do this. That has nothing to do with my license. Doesn't matter. We're going to pull your license unless you do what the government says and thus deprive them of be the ability to make an income in their chosen occupation. Well, that, 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 that was kind of the proposal for, for doctors is, is that link it to licensure. You have to take Medicaid 
uh, or, and, and be subject to control by the government through the Medicaid system, or, or you will not have the ability to practice medicine. That's draconian. It's, it's, it's a reflexive authoritarianism. Instead of saying, okay, we're going to convince you, you know, we're going to tell you why this is good and let you make your own decision. And if they truly believed in what they were doing and, and they had a compelling argument, you wouldn't have to compel anything. You would, you would just make the argument and, and people would voluntarily do it because it's better, but they have to force it because it's not. Do you have time for one more? Sure. Now, this is, I love this. An informed electorate of citizen patients is essential to hold decision makers accountable regarding our healthcare system, which is one fifth of our economy. Yet we are not just uninformed, we are misinformed. What can be done? Well, things like this, and thank you for, I know it's not a huge group, but every one of you, thank you for watching. I'm hoping you're learning. You are our voices. I'm only one person. I try to do what I can. I don't get paid for any of this. You know, actually, it takes my time. And, and you know, um, I, I pay to fly to D.C. and talk to legislators and things like that. So I don't get paid a penny for any of this stuff. I'm not saying you have to sacrifice your life as, as some of us have done. But just be a voice out there. Make people aware that there are differences. I, I, one thing I've, I wrote an op-ed with a friend of mine who's a psychologist several years back, it was, do the American citizenry suffer um, from Stockholm Syndrome? And if those of you who know Stockholm Syndrome, this woman was taken captive and she became essentially a defender of her captors because she, she adopted their mentality. Well, I think the American populace is in a similar situation. We are victimized by the American healthcare system price-wise. I mean, we're just b being destroyed by it. And yet when you offer alternatives like what we're doing or what Keith Smith does, you actually get reflexive um, like condescension. Ah, it's, you can't do that. that you, no, no way. That's not, that's not right. You know, people saying that kind of stuff. And, and I was like, well, you're the one being victimized by this. We're offering you better options. And I realized that, that it's a Stockholm Syndrome-like scenario. So you guys be a voice for truth in the wilderness. Get out there. Get, let people know there, that this is not crazy. I, the good thing about being one of the early docs doing this, we took a lot of heat for it. That heat is dissipating. People are starting to recognize direct primary care and other types of uh, direct programs are, are perfectly ethical, are perfectly rational. And so it's becoming more accepted. So you probably won't get as much pushback though. I can't say none exists, it still does, but you're likely to receive a lot less of it than we did in the early days when there were literally like a couple dozen of, of us across the entire nation doing it. Well, with that, I know you are going back to patients today. So I am very thankful for Actually, you. Actually, not, not down at home. <laughs> Yeah, I left care, the clinic to do this, right. so, um, which you can do when you're your own boss. So absolutely. that's another advantage. It's wonderful. Um, I am very thankful to have you here today. Um, I'm also thankful for our students that are streaming this within their chapters. So um, I love how this worked out. I'm, I've been getting texts and videos of how this worked out within streaming this within their own um, within their own chapters. Um, this is our first time trying to do that. So it worked out well. Um, we appreciate so, everybody. Yeah, so thank you very much for joining us today. Um, for those of you that are new, I know we have some people that have not joined us today. You can catch our, we record this and then we put it up onto our YouTube channel. Um, so look for that in a few days. We will be sending out that link. Uh, you can also view our past recordings. Uh, we have a lot more planned. So I will be putting, uh, sending out our, the rest of our lineup for the rest of this year and moving on into the new year, which I can't believe we're almost there. So thank you so much, Dr. Chad Savage, and thank you all for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed today's edition of the Benjamin Rush Institute's virtual events series. To learn more about our educational programs and events just like the virtual events series, I encourage you to visit our website. While you're there, you can subscribe to the Benjamin Rush Institute's YouTube channel and link not only to all episodes in this series, but also to all of our past meetings, events, and conferences. And please consider supporting our work on behalf of the medical students we serve by donating to our efforts. Your support is vital if we are to continue to provide important educational programs and events just like this one. We appreciate your support, and please watch for your invitation to the next edition of the Benjamin Rush Institute's Virtual Events Series.